So um, thank you everyone um, for our latest uh, fireside chat um, with uh, Arif Saab, who's basically um, a very interesting uh, businessman slash entrepreneur uh, who's come a long way over the years uh, from his roots in Pakistan um, as, as an engineer, uh, gradually developing into um, someone who looked across the business uh, at both marketing and sales, eventually becoming almost an entrepreneur, uh, leading um, one of the leading sort of cybersecurity firms, Extra Hop, for the last six years. Uh, that was acquired last year by Bain Capital. Um, Arif has stepped down from an operational role uh, to board advisory roles recently. Um, previously, he was uh, president of Fruit Networks for almost seven years. Um, so it's been an interesting journey uh, over the last several years. And uh, I think it's sort of a mix of uh, working your way up in a corporation, uh, learning the ropes, um, but also developing uh, the kind of skill sets that are required to actually run uh, a large business and growing it uh, in an entrepreneurial fashion over the years. So um, the way we are going to you know, do this webinar as usual is first, we're going to have about 30 minutes or so going through um, this journey. Um, and at the end of it, we'll sort of open the floor for Q&A, uh, which you can post uh, along the way as we as we go through it. Um, so maybe we can, we can start, uh, Arif Saab, uh, on our side. Um, first sort of question, I think uh, every, you know, it's sort of uh, standard, but, you know, uh, mandatory. So uh, in a sense, early days in your journey. So you, I understand you went to government college Lahore. Um, so you're a student there. You come from a family which has, uh, I guess, a lot of engineers within the family. And then you end up in UAD Lahore. So tell us about your early days a little bit in Pakistan. How, how were they? How, how did they prepare you for, for the route ahead in a way? Um, thank you, Salman, and assalamu alaikum. Yeah. I grew up in Lahore, as, as you said, went to a school which perhaps your parents might know, uh, St. Model School, it was uh, very well known in those days. Uh, everybody who went to St. Model went to Government College Lahore, and that's what I did. And then after two years in GC, went to Engineering University, and, and as, as you mentioned, I did my undergraduate in Devali, and in those days, Devali had two different splits you could do in power or you could do in communication and electronics, of course, I did in power and electronics. Uh, after, and then as, as you mentioned, I come from, my dad was an engineer in railways and then we had many pe people in the family who were scientists and educated abroad and, and, and a lot of on the female sides were, were doctors, it was an interesting combination. So there was a very natural tendency for me to come overseas as well, otherwise people would have thought I'm alike, that I didn't go overseas, studied and did higher education. Uh, I had two choices after graduation, either I go, go to the public sector and join WAPDA or TNT in those days, PTCL was called, uh, or railways or whatever, and uh, I said I won't do that because I'm going to go overseas, so I taught at Engineering University for a little less than two years before coming uh, to the US. I came to the US to uh, do a PhD, but later on changed my mind, and, and I, I can tell you a little bit why I changed my mind at that time. But that's really, I mean, it was great fun days, uh, great strong Pakistan. Uh, everybody was proud of there was prosperity and all. We we saw a lot of early days uh, uh, of uh, uh, prosperity in Pakistan, driven by stability in the governments and all. And then while we were leaving, a uh, lot of changes started to happen. So, so basically, um, so so you 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 come out of the university. You have this, uh, you know, one of the prize jobs available in a way. You know, going to the to to the government sector, and and you don't go for it. Why is that? Well, as I said, majority of the men in our, my family were educated abroad, some Europe, UK, some US as well. So there was kind of a direction set uh, that you need to go and 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 get some higher studies. So that was one. And then I wasn't attracted. I mean, you, you, you know, you can be a, a, a hard working, conscientious, honest government servant, uh, but but I didn't necessarily like the, the environment which was around in some of those places. I'm, I'm not demeaning one of those organizations, 
my dad was in railways uh, himself. Uh, uh, so, but I just decided that, hey, if I'm going to go outside to study and, and higher education, it would be better for me to, till I get admission and, uh, you know, you were always looking for a search association uh, assistantship in those days because uh, it was uh, pretty costly. So you wanted a tuition waiver and a four or five dollar stipend to, to fund. So, so it takes time. And that's why I taught in the university for a while, which was good because you always stayed in with the technology and, and were up to date. So when we came to the U.S., uh, uh, doing the coursework was a breeze because some of our professors in UET uh, on the communications are brilliant and they developed a foundation which made it very easy for us to uh, study. I mean, I picked an area called digital signal processing, DSP in those days. It's still uh, pretty well known, but uh, uh, and, and didn't have any difficulty because of the foundational work which was done at UET. Maybe we were not, not practically strong, but our theoretical background was very, very strong. Mm -hmm. No, that, 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 that's uh, I think, and, and here we're talking about, I guess, the 70s, right? And, uh, and almost 80s has started. Almost 80s has started. And right? I came to the US, 70s, yeah. Yeah, so 70s, 80s. Yeah. And so, so, so you leave for the US. Um, and I, I guess the initial idea was to go and, and do a PhD, and then something changed your mind. What happened? Yeah, I, yeah, well, we had a thesis requirement even for masters and, and I just went to a couple of, you know, campus interviewing was very common those days. And there were a lot of job offers and especially given signal processing was a hot topic those days. Uh, I started getting a lot of uh, jobs and as a foreign student and, and also people willing to give you a green card the day you start your job kind of became a little attractive. And also I felt that my own personality was such that working for one in the labs for the next few years would be a lot, as well as in those days, a uh, uh, lot more people who went for a PhD took an academic route. And that was not something for me. So I felt that maybe I should jump into the industry and, and, and uh, see what are the opportunities there. Uh, and I also wanted to do an, an MBA, which I did right after my master's by, while I moved to, to Oregon. Uh, uh, so, so I think that combination made me more, uh, uh, I would say, fit for for the, the private sector in the industry rather than go to academia with a PhD. Hmm. And if you think back uh, on, on you know in terms of your um, student days um, in the US early early on, I mean, how would you compare? I mean, do you think it was a similar environment to what it is today, or was it more welcoming or less welcoming? Uh, back in the I think day. it's a lot more welcoming uh, at yeah. that time. I, I don't know. I have an experience today. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how the foreign students feel. I know there mm. is a restriction here these days. Uh, mm. uh, but in those days, there were not a whole, whole lot of uh, Pakistanis coming to the graduate schools and, and, and going for a master's and a PhD or an MBA in mm. my case. Uh, there were some remnants of uh, Iran uh, messy hostages thing, and there were times when some ignorant people would say something that go back and all. But overall, it was a lot more uh, welcoming environment. So you 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 basically you know did you do your grad school? You basically um, start your professional career, and then I think you pretty much uh, early on went for your MBA as well, right? So. Yes. Um, so tell us about your early sort of phase of your career and how, how did, did that develop now coming from a you know, technical background and then you sort of have an engineering sort of MBA hat on top as well. So yeah, what no, I started as an engineer, I, 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 I joined a pretty big name in instrumentation. There was Hewlett Packard and Tektronix. These were the two companies which were into electronic instrumentation. So I met somebody at a conference in Princeton and they say, hey, we, we're going to hire you and you can work in the area of digital signal processing, which was a good thing. You get a job, you are a foreign student, you get a green card and you get to work in the area of specialization. So I, so I moved there and, and started to work on developing a DSP chip because the digital instrumentation required a lot of processing of the signals to be able to extract information out of it and display whether it would be a time series or it'd be a spectrum or whatever. So, so really worked on that. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I think I was telling you earlier that I have a conversation that 
if the environment was conducive as it is today, like the VC money is available, a lot more, uh, like when I look at Park Launch and, and such a great work, Ali, and you are doing and, and networking, that didn't exist those days. Uh, but now when I look back, and even at that time, people mentioned that I could have easily spun off and then gone and started the business of DSP chips against Texas Instrument of Analog Devices and all that, but didn't do that, right? Uh, so uh, enjoyed that whole path, uh, went up the technical ladder pretty fast. I think in five years, I was a principal engineer and all, but inside me was always thinking about commercial side and all that. And then yeah. I mentioned that I had an MBA and I said, hey, I need to go into marketing, especially from strategic marketing perspective, rather than sales support, technical marketing. And I, I try hard and then and I got into it and then eventually uh, became a group marketing manager. In those days, we didn't have VP titles and all. Uh, which was $600 million business. This is uh, mid uh, So th that was really a lot of fun. So that's fascinating. So I think so you, you come from a pure engineering background and then you very quickly sort of transition into this business role and within that sales and marketing and, and, and most of the engineers I know, probably that's, that's, that's the last thing they would think of, uh, especially once they have gone through guard school and they've started landing the landed a nice sort of career on the technical side. Uh, typically, the marketing sales bit is they think of it of as either something they the outside the realm of their understanding, or it's almost they look down upon a lot of these things. And I think that's a typical impression I, I get talking to a lot of engineers, right? Um, but, yeah, that was not the case, and I I think I felt that in those days uh, there was lack of what I call strategic marketing. How do you think about? Uh, mm -hmm. expanding your markets? How do you think about strategic pricing so that you can gain share and all those? And for mm -hmm. that, you need an MBA type framework. I think I mentioned that to you earlier that uh, there was a choice many of us have to make and I'm sure some of the people in the audience will be making the choice. Do you go to an IV for an MBA or just have a, a, a good uh, mm -hmm. uh, MBA, which is sufficient? My own point of view is that if you are switching your career and going into consulting and financing, uh, then perhaps an IV MBA is very helpful. But if you're staying within the same organization and want to have a broader understanding of business and develop and grow your skills, mm -hmm. then a good, a good MBA is good enough uh, uh, from the top 50 schools or whatever, because it allows you the framework. And I think that's what I did uh, while I was an engineer, as you said, uh, but I had developed pretty good fundamentals and, and, and a framework uh, about how do you think about creating new markets and expanding and, and the pricing strategies which come with it to gain share and all those things and how do you promote so so I think it was not very difficult and, right. and, and, and in those days the marketing as you said why engineers didn't like it was mostly subservient to sales they, they will tell you put a knob here a screen here but do enablement and a training whereas I was trying to go in the other direction that how we can expand the business for the company. And that was well liked by Raps and even the board and that's how I got that opportunity. So I, I guess the, the MBA sort of helped, I, I guess in that, in, term, in that terms, in terms of like opening up the horizons um, or, uh, around that thinking. Um, I see that you know, you've, you've basically worked at uh, Tectronics for, for quite, a bit, quite a bit of time, but then you have this transition where you end up at Danaher Corporation and, and Fluke Networks. How did that transition happen? Yeah, so I, I was at Technonics for quite a long time and then eventually became VP general manager of their te telecommunications and video uh, businesses. Uh, uh, the company got acquired by, by, by Danaher, which is a conglomerate, is, exists today, one of the, the very well-run companies. Uh, not many people know the name, uh, but, but it's a 30 plus billion dollar company and considered to be the, the best breeding ground for uh, CEOs like GE used to be, uh, they acquired uh, uh, Tectronics at that time and, and they were looking for somebody to uh, lead one of their, another operating companies called Fluke Networks, which is about, at that time, 350, by the time I left about $450 million business, which was aimed at uh, uh, IT and primarily it had got different businesses uh, Wi-Fi security and application performance management and tons of hand hand ID too. Uh, and then they, they, they wanted a leader for that. And that's how uh, I, I joined was uh, because of the acquisition, it, the opportunity came up because uh, the business is north of Seattle next to 
uh, Boeing in the Everett area. So uh, there were two things which really was very interesting in that seven years. Uh, one was uh, there were multiple businesses as part of Sloop Networks and each business was as a different uh, life cycle stage. Uh, one business was pretty mature and more or less flat and declining market. So how do you manage that? Then mm -hmm. one was, hey, moderate growth. And then there was an area like Wi-Fi security and all that, which were really growing very, very fast. And, and, and really you use the old, those of you who have uh, studied BCG more, even though it's a very, very old model or a GE uh, portfolio model, but it really works uh, that you look at your mature market where there's no growth. So you squeeze investment and spending there and, and make it a cash cow and then use that cash to go and fund your businesses, which are really high growth potential so that you make sure that you are making the proper investments. So I think that whole balancing of the, the, the portfolio management in four different business units I had uh, was a very good experience because you knew how to manage a mature business and you knew how to fund and accelerate growth uh, in, in, a, in a growth journey. One was that big learning for those years. And the other yeah. ones, uh, Danaher itself as a company, uh, I think is a world-class, there is nothing fair to it when it comes to lean management philosophies. And lean management philosophies comes from Toyota Motors, uh, which they have used those quality circles and Kaizen's and root cause analysis, continuous improvement, but they used only on the factory floor. Whereas yeah. Danaher made it a success to use that in um, uh, what I would say in, in, in the commercial area and, and then how to use that for uh, pricing, for salesforce effectiveness and business planning. So those tools were so helpful and I don't believe that many leaders today have that exposure uh, of looking at business from, from lean principles. Uh, that doesn't mean that you are not growth oriented, but you are just using those tools to uh, improve your execution and we continue to be better. So I think these two areas for me, managing businesses at different life cycle stages and also the lean management as extends into the commercial side of the business uh, was a key area for me to learn. So I guess it, this is a big transition part, part in your career, I guess, you know, so you, you basically have now, you know, you know led a sales uh, marketing uh, team. You have now, Worked in this leadership role in and uh, through through Denier's acquisition of Tectonix, um, and effectively, uh, you know, a, a company which is ahead of the curve in terms of its approach to business and with Kaizen, lean management, so on and so forth. And so you get, I guess, this very well-rounded exposure um, uh, to to one of the you know one of the one of the one of the leaders in the industry in terms of management and management philosophy, right? Um, and I guess that probably is, is a pivotal, you know, part, part of your career in, in that sense and you're preparing you for the, for the next big move, I guess, going forward for you. Um, so extra half. Now, how, how did you land in that role? So you've been here now at Fluke Denair for a while, uh, leading this, you know, nice, have this probably comfortable job, you're well settled, you know, you're, you're probably making decent money. And then this opportunity comes along, and and so what was the background around this, and and you know what made you take it in the first place? Sure. And I'll definitely uh, uh, give you more color because I think yes, there's a lot more learning uh, uh, around what happened at Extra Hop and how it became a success and how we sold it to Bain Capital about six seven months ago. Uh, uh, as I said, Fluke Networks was north of Seattle. And I knew a couple of uh, 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 VCs in, in, in Seattle area, and, and one of them, a uh, very well known uh, VC there, I, I knew a, the lead managing director, and I was talking to him, and he mentioned that uh, they have a portfolio company, it's about 40 to $50 million, and it's kind of a start. They have a great technology, and we would like, if you would be interested, we would like you to come and become the CEO. Uh, and the founders will step aside and, and see if you can take this company and, and then grow it. So that was the whole premise. And I took a quick look at it. They were fantastic technology, fantastic people. Uh, but but, and, and, but the, 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 the market they were going after was in my mind, if those of you who have studied uh, Michael Porter's Five Forces, uh, it's an old concept, but it, concept, it was an unattractive market because the TAM was limited and the growth had slowed down. And the only way for you to grow in that market was 
uh, through gaining market share. But uh, to gain market share in a flattish market basically means massive investment in go to market for a perpetual period of time, which perhaps is not the best use of money. Uh, and I, I, I knew that from, because Fluke had a portion of business, which was an application and performance uh, monitoring. And I said, hey, this is something I know, and I, I believe internally it's not a hugely attractive market. Uh, so I can join the business and work with the team there and see how we can pivot and transform the business. So that was really what got me into extra hard. And, so and then the whole story of pivoting to yeah. cyber security started from there. So you bring up an interesting point. So, and I think that's some uh, challenge which a lot of the startups, um, uh, I think on our platform keep on coming across. Uh, either the product market fit is not there and, or, or, or you know, they're, they're facing an uphill task. And the question really is, do you go, keep on doing what you're trying to do or do you pivot, right? And yeah. And what, how do you just think about those kind of decisions? And I think that's what you sort of alluded to that you are effectively in a market which is, has a lot of headwinds, uh, growing is more difficult. Um, so either you keep on trying to do, uh, going against uh, the currents or you maybe pivot here. So, so I guess you, you looked at this business, you, you, you did your analysis and then you said, okay, um, I can do this, but, but then the business has to transform into something else over time. Yes. So, so, so you, so you went in, so what, what's, what, what is the change that you have done on, on this business early on? Yeah. So uh, as you said that we could have continued, our growth would not have been as, as fast. Maybe we could grow 15 to 20% a year, which is for some investors may not be a bad thing. And you can continue that way. But we felt that, uh, and an investor and then the board felt that we need to go into markets, which are allow us to grow much faster. And, and, and so uh, we effectively started to do gather voice of the customers. Basically, we went back to our customers and tried to see what, what is the biggest pain points they have. And luckily those days, one of the pain points, which is today even more so, was, hey, how do you secure your critical assets? Uh, and, and they have many tools, security, yet the bad guys can still get inside your system or an IT environment and be able to steal the stuff. So so. That gave us indication that, hey, uh, that would be a, a market that would be attractive. And then the next step was to say, okay, uh, is this market going to grow? Is the TAM going to expand? Mm -hmm. What kind of a barriers do I have? And how do I change my current foundation technology to have a good product market fit? Because while we had a product market fit in the performance space also, the market itself was inherently not, not a high growth market. So there was not a big issue of product market fit there, but was the attractiveness of the market. Here we said, hey, we, we have a good technology. How do we find a market which is more attractive, expanding TAM, real problems being solved, something which is on the mind of the key decision makers uh, and cybersecurity really came into. And then, and then the good news was some of our, the uh, security professions in the, or practitioners in the, in the security space were already using our uh, foundation technology because it had built in analytics and a lot of machine learning in it uh, to be able to look at application and network behavior. So uh, they were already using it in a very special way for some tricky issues related to cybersecurity, whether it would be ransomware or it would be related to Active Directory issues or DNS server issues and all. I won't go into much technology there. So, th so, so that really gave us a sense that, hey, this will be the space and then the next pass was that, okay, security is a very large space. Now, how do you find a niche or a segment for yourself where you can compete? And that's where the, the, the both the, the, your own understanding of the market, your CTO and then the, the other people, as well as voice of the customer becomes important. And it became very clear very early to us that, hey, while there are tools such as uh, uh, endpoint detection tools or, or uh, antivirus programs, which are putting agents into uh, your laptops or, or other places if you're in the IoT space and collect data to see if there is something fishy happening. Or you could also be uh, gathering the, the log data from the machines and to be able to look from there, like the Splunk and others do, uh, what is going on, is, it a, is an event happening or not? But nobody was looking at network data and driving intelligence from it to be able to see, okay, if there is an anomalous behavior going on uh, 
in your surveys or, or wherever. So we latched onto that because that was our core competence is to look at network data and to be able to drive intelligence for it. But we were doing it for the performance space and now we started to do it for the security space. So the learn was, has to be an expanding time, has to be a real problem which you are trying to solve. You have core competencies and foundational technology which can match for there. And then uh, you start, uh, once the mission is clear and the strategy is placed, you go after execution. So this is, I guess, uh, you're talking about really uh, the 2010s in a way, right? Early on. Uh, uh, no, so this is 2016. 16. So yeah, almost like not that not that far back, right? So uh, if I, yeah. So you pivot. Um, you I guess uh, you know start benefiting from from this expanded TAM. Um, you have you basically use your existing I guess resources or know how to actually develop into this new market. And and you know things look good for a while. Uh, you know you know sales are increasing. Uh, market is you know market itself is expanding. All is well. And then you are looking to I guess monetize. But then COVID happens. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. So the business started to grow 40, 50 percent in 2018, 2019. We had even a bigger plan for 2020. Uh, one thing I would say is that. Uh, there is a little challenge, and I think that might be something helpful for the entrepreneurs who are on the call or might listen later on. While we were very excited about that, hey, we are becoming a cybersecurity company, we have identified a segment or a niche where we felt that we had the best chance to succeed because our technology was good, but it was a new market. Uh, mm -hmm. Gartner had just started to track it for Esther and all that. So there are challenges going into after new market because it's a, in the beginning, an evangelical sale because the budgets are not set for that kind of product because that product didn't exist because it was called, if the space we went after is called network detection and response and the R market. And it looks at, basically, it's a way to uh, detect stealthy advanced threats these days, which are everywhere, which get into your environment and, and they stay dormant for a while, they establish a, 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 a command and control and then start uh, exfiltrating uh, critical assets out. And, and, and the way to do that is to, to, to baseline the behavior of the users and the applications and everything in the traffic. And then if there is an anomalous behavior, you detect it with machine learning, uh, which is done in the cloud and all that. So, I'm, But what I was trying to say is that when, while it's easy to pivot in a new space, but then there are challenges with the new space, especially if it is a new category. Because those of you who are in the marketing, establishing and creating a new product category is, is requires a lot of uh, evangel uh, 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 evangelism uh, uh, in the marketplace. And, 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 and there were a lot of challenges for us to face. And that's a total separate discussion that how do you do uh, uh, that type of evangelism in the market? Uh, but luckily, we, were, we, we did it right and we succeeded. Uh, and the business grew, and then you, you're saying uh, COVID comes in, and, and COVID uh, created a problem for everybody, right? Nobody knew what this thing is, and majority of our business was in the data centers, mm -hmm. and nobody was going in the data centers, and we couldn't do more proof of concept uh, with, with the customers. Neither our sales engineers will go in the data center, neither the, the security guys will come in there. How do you prospect, and how do you sell? Uh, so, so that's where we decided that we need to also pivot and instead of having a more on-prem solution, develop a SaaS solution, which is so very easy to deploy that nobody has to go to the data. So switching the company again uh, uh, from uh, being a on-prem perpetual licensing company to a SaaS and subscription model, we did that in six to nine months. And, 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 and because of that, uh, the whole business became uh, SaaS business. And, and now it was easy for our reps and SCs to go and, and demonstrate the value of the solution which we have without physically going into a data center because it was all deployed through the cloud and it was a SaaS service. Uh, and that took off. Now, I think when I left 80, 90% of the business was a SaaS business. There are still some customers uh, in, in, in certain segments of the market like, and, a, a on-prem data center solution. Uh, so that was another privilege. So in five years time from when I joined early 2016 
to the time I left a week ago, we did three transitions. We, we pivoted from a application performance company or network performance company to cybersecurity. We pivoted from uh, on-prem to SaaS, and we pivoted from perpetual licensing to subscription licensing. Uh, very few companies in a period of five to six years are able to do that. I mean, they did it. And we had a huge, so, so we recovered because of that. We had a strong second half of 2020 and 2021. Uh, I, I think there's a press release also. We knew either 52% or something in ARR and then, and then the company started going back again. So and then I can talk the next thing. I'm sure you're going to ask me then what about the exit, right? <laughs> no, 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 that, no that, that's, that's fascinating. I think the, um, I think not many companies, very few companies can actually claim one pivot. I mean, you have seen, done about three pivots more or less uh, in the space of five, six years. And I think probably a lot of learnings here for young entrepreneurs and uh, startups, uh, not to shy away uh, when the problem stares you in the face, uh, look at all the options that are available, which can be done, right? Um, I think one thing which many companies don't do during difficult economic times is everybody, of course, as an entrepreneur, you need to keep an eye on your cash because cash is king. But there are areas of investment which you can make when your competitors are not. And whether it's the R&D or it might be into how your go-to-market is. And if you do that in a thoughtful manner, because you don't want to become bankrupt either, because if there is no pull in the market for your products, then you are consuming cash and you need to be very careful about where you invest. But I do believe that instead of hunkering down and putting your head down, that's the best time to go in and invest one or two areas to take a comparative lead. And I think that's uh, uh, we did. And I would recommend all the, the people because you know business cycles are there. I mean, right now the market is good. Those who are having their businesses six years down the road, there might be a recession or something. Then what do you do? And my recommendation is that, hey, invest in special areas where we think you can gain competitive advantage. And if you do that, when the markets recover, you are in a much better position than your comp competition is. It's a bold, courageous move, but only bold will win, right? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, the, the brave take, take all at the end of the day. Uh, so you did your second pivot and, uh, you know, mashallah, it's, it, 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 you know, it fit the, the requirements of the market at, at, you know, at that point in time. Now, how did you start thinking about exiting? Um, so what, what was the sort of uh, thought process that you had? I'm assuming, you know, there are people or voices within the company or shareholders saying, you know, maybe let's, let's wait for a bit more. We can, we can, we, you know, if it, it has not maxed out today. Uh, there were people probably who were wanted, were eager to exit. And then there were people who were sort of undecided in between. And, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of bankers like myself were telling you, absolutely, let's go forward now. And, and obviously they all have their vested interest in that saying, saying so. So uh, how, what was your thought process in terms of timing of the exit, whether the decision to go forward with the exit and, and, how, and what, what kind of avenues you should explore? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I, and, and I will encourage all the entrepreneurs, while it's always exciting to think about exit because there are a lot of rewards with that. But I think the foremost goal of an entrepreneur, entrepreneur should be to build a company which is constantly uh, increasing value. And, and, and I, I think as long as that is the mission that, hey, I'm, I'm solving real customer problems, I have a clear mission and I'm customer centric. If you do that, growth comes and value gets created. And I think that should be the focus of every CEO and an entrepreneur. Once you build a company which is successful, then exit becomes a choice and a byproduct. And, and I think that's how we were thinking. And then as we put the business back on track after COVID started growing 40, 50%, we started to think about, hey, what are the different avenues? And as you said, bankers are hooting around you all the time, big name bankers and all that, and they're all having their opinion and all. Uh, we thought of going the, the public route and going public. And then we even started working with a preliminary S1 and all those and then adding legal people and more uh, uh, investing in, in finance and accounting because there's a lot of compliance and all that required and all. But at the same time, uh, uh, early last year, we started to getting a lot of inbound uh, uh, conversations from Strategics, which is a, another large company, or a sponsors, which are a PE company who started showing interest because they saw we have 
the company has pivoted in cybersecurity, the company is a SaaS company now, and it's still in the early stage and there is a huge time and for them to gain share. Uh, and our focus was primarily Americas, although we have expanded internationally also. So everybody saw massive opportunity in this company. So we started getting a lot of inbound interest, as you know, Salman works. Uh, and and, and we, we uh, started to, of course, it's always good to talk. You know, you, there's no downside to it. And, 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 and at some point we felt that uh, uh, it may be worthwhile to get serious uh, with some of the, the, the people who are inquiring and interested in, 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 in looking at our company for some sort of a partnership. You go to the board, you talk to the investors, you talk to the founders and all that. And, and you know, everybody has been in the business for, uh, I think Extra Hub was uh, 13 or 14 years old now. And, and then we decided that, hey, if we are able to get a good valuation, uh, it may be worthwhile to do this thing in two phases that you have one exit and then you can still do an IPO later on. And, and we engaged with uh, a banker, very well known, uh, and, uh, and decided we have multiple uh, parts to engage with. Uh, it's good to have choices, both on the strategic side as well as the sponsor. And we eventually just, uh, uh, came in agreement uh, to be uh, bought out by uh, being capital that happened in July of last year. Uh, so th that's how the process came uh, as it was in mind. Uh, once we were grow the business back up, uh, I could be an IPO, but the inbound conversations became quite strong. And then we settled in selling the business for 900 million to, to Bain. And I'm, I'm sure uh, as I, you mentioned on that, I stepped down as a CEO last week and moving to more advisory role, but I, I know the business we, we had uh, done very well in, in, in last year and in Q1 and all, and I think there's a huge massive opportunity ahead in a couple of years for the company. So I think now sort of that you've sort of gone full circle, I think we can, we can sort of um, uh, leverage a bit on, I think sort of the key lessons that you've sort of learned uh, and, and, and for over the years, I think as in through your experience, because you've gone through the full cycle, you've, you've, you've done jobs, you've worked in corporates, you've pivoted yourself professionally, uh, and then you pivoted your company uh, a couple of times in between. So if you were to say, you know, and I think that's, uh, if you would take like two or three top lessons uh, from your own career, what would they be um, for young entrepreneurs, startup founders yeah. or managers? I think from that angle, if I just look at, I forget about my 35 years of career, but most from, from entrepreneur's perspective, I think it's very important that whatever business you do, uh, you have a mission. And, and, and I think organizations which are built around a mission uh, is very important. For example, our mission was to stop advanced stealthy cyber threats. Okay, And, and then we, we build a company around it. Now I know when, when there are entrepreneurs in Pakistan, there's a lot of opportunities to just take some of the uh, e-commerce businesses which are in uh, US or India or elsewhere or China and, and uh, have their version in Pakistan, which is I think is a very successful model. And, and that, that requires a mission. So I would say mission is important and being customer centric is very important. I think if you are uh, connected to the customers, listening to them and have a mission, you can, can be really successful. The other one is that the problem which you solve as part of your mission has to be a real problem. It has to be a true pain point and there is budget associated with it that people are willing to spend money uh, to, to, to get your solution to solve that problem. It has to be a real problem. It, it doesn't need that. I've seen people building things that, oh, this is a very elegant solution and we are building and people will come. And, and that doesn't work. And, and you must have seen many companies in your life as you invest or, or do the MA for them, Salman. Uh, the other one is, uh, and, and it's a mistake which many entrepreneurs make, and Extra Hub was doing that too. There is so much belief in the product and the technology which the, the entrepreneurs and the early founders build it. But if the technology is really strong, then make sure that you are also investing in a commensurate level on the go-to-market side of the things. And, and, and then not that if you build the best widget, it will automatically sell, it doesn't sell. Uh, so, so investing in the go-to-market and making sure that 
you exactly segment the market and you know the buyer's purchase criteria and how the pricing needs to be. Are you gaining share or whatever kind of thing? Who do you need to get your message to? How your demand gen is going to be? How your settlement is? That's a massive, massive investment in a big area. And many times entrepreneurs tend to ignore that. And I don't think that you can have a hyper growth uh, unless you do that both in parallel. I mean, having the right time right for the solving the right problem is the first step. Without that, you don't have a company. But once you have that, don't underestimate the investment required uh, in the go-to-market model. And then, and the lastly would be, I would say, uh, as I said, there is an investment opportunity in the down market as well because it creates competitive advantage if you're thoughtful. But at the end of the day, there's nothing like uh, maniacal focus on execution and getting results. Uh, I got that out of my seven years at Denner, but. Uh, it, it, it is very important uh, that you, once you have a strategy, you have the, the right team and the right uh, structure and the right, uh, what I call processes or systems in place so that you can monitor and inspect the progress and be able to course correct if things are not right by doing the root cause analysis and all that. And so without execution, there are many ideas which are out there. They fail because either the product market fit is not there or you didn't invest in the go-to market or there was not a, a, a good operational strength uh, in, the, in the leadership team to be able to deliver results. So I think these uh, three, I would really uh, request the, the entrepreneurs who might be, who are on the call or would be listening that it's very critical from my perspective to succeed. And I think you touched upon a very interesting point, which is around, uh, I think, having your, your train, you're having a leadership team with you uh, for that execution bit, and which is critical, right, at the end of the day. Um, how do you actually build a team which, which can execute, uh, especially your management team? I mean, what, 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 what's your philosophy around building the right management team and training them? Yeah, for that uh, very good question. Uh, of course, you need to... Uh, you, 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 when, you, when you hire and you are building a team, you, you really uh, do a very, what I would say, a thorough, uh, have a thorough structured interview process and to be able to go back to see what are the values of, of the, the, the person, what really makes the, the, the person uh, get uh, passionate and, 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 and about something. Uh, do, they, do they have experiences and have the demonstrate with examples that they are results oriented, if that's important. Or if you're looking for a CMO and you're looking for somebody who is, helps you in a demand gen, what type of uh, demand gen the person has, has done in their past, uh, how well they are well versed with digital demand gen, which is everything these days versus the old way of tier shows and all that. So I think it is, it is an effort, but you have to take it seriously. I think if you are taking serious, I'm a big believer of there was an old article by McKinsey, seven S's. I don't use all the S's, but I use four S's and uh, at least I did that in extra half. You have to have a strategy with first S. The next is the structure. The third is the staffing, the question you are asking. You have to take it seriously. And the fourth one is uh, systems or processes and the, how you inspect progress and how do you see you are getting results. So I think if you uh, do these four things, uh, in, in a thoughtful and serious manner and bring people who, who share the mission with you and, and can do the different things. Uh, uh, they have to be specialists in the area. I mean, the sales guy need to make sure that they can add capacity, they can do sales enablement, they are able to, depends whether you're selling the high end of the enterprise market or the SMB market, they have that experience of the SaaS guy. So definitely the competencies you have to see, but then they're, are they mission driven? Do their values align with your companies? Are the team players? Do they fit in your culture? Culture is very, very important. So that's a separate discussion. You, you asked a very deeper question, but uh, all I would say is that you have to take all those things very seriously and be very thoughtful as you build the team. And as the company grows, the middle management becomes even more important than the leadership team because that's where the thing action really happens. Uh, the, the CEO is in the corner office and then talking strategy and dealing with investors and board and all that. But the everyday execution is happening at your director level or the senior manager level. And you need to make sure that they are enabled, empowered and, and, and in the organization. And that's a totally separate topic uh, to talk about. 
I, I guess one of the things you highlighted earlier is, is you know, while, you know, you're going and, and working on your strategy, you also look at other sort of, I guess, opportunities and, and you selectively invest, um, you know, while you, your competitors may have a blind spot at that point in time to sort of find the winners, right, in a way uh, for the future of the, of the business. But how do you think about um, what kind of criteria do you, have you used when thinking about those kind of strategic investments uh, along the way? Was it like a structured process on your side? It, was it more, um, you know, find the winners as, as you go along by chance? Uh, what, what, how, how did you go around that process yeah. in, your, in your career? I, I think both can work. I mean, I've seen a board of a company where they have all along seen and things didn't work and then uh, changed the course a little bit and, and went along. Sorry. Uh, uh, what, what one has to do is uh, uh, I'm a big believer of some structure there. Uh, uh, I, I think it starts with gathering voice of the customers. The VOC is very, very critical. I mean, uh, gone are the days where you can just, yeah, the initial idea can very well be a, a thought of an entrepreneur that yeah, I see a gap somewhere or I see a a pain point I can solve it, but I think in order to uh, uh, make it more mature, effective solution, you have to have a voice of the customer. But I think a formal process on looking at where the white space is, and those of you who have read that book, The Blue Ocean and all that, right? I mean, you want to find those white spaces and then figure out where, then further segmentation and where your good fit is and all that. So I think it has to be both combination of heuristic heuristically reaching to that point through your heart and gut feel, and then some process to validate that what you are trying to do, it, it makes sense because you're talking about your money or somebody else's money and millions of dollars here. So you can be just ad hoc, while I think your, your gut and your heart will tell you, but then you'll have to justify that and create that with more structured solutions uh, by segmenting and market and, and doing the, the market mapping and assessing the product market fit and all that's and then attractiveness of the market. In terms of your 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 standard extra hub, if you would could sort of put put your um, um, you, if you would choose one one um, one sort of achievement, what would would it be? And what what are you most proud of um, at your with your, with your standard extra hub? I I think the the. the we we built a very strong team. I mean, the team stayed with me for six years. I was there, uh, so uh, the strong team, which together uh, uh, reestablished the mission of the company, and then successfully executed to grow the business. I mean, I should be throwing the numbers, but uh, we have become a pretty big company in terms of ARR and all that. I, I think that whole transition. Uh, I feel really very, very good because it was, uh, even though I was more a professional CEO, but I acted like as an uh, entrepreneur because uh, we had foundation technology, but we abandoned the market we were in and found a new space to go and create value. Uh, and then the whole process of setting the direction, picking the market, making sure the product fits in there, putting the go to market and have a machinery to execute uh, and then eventually an exit. I think that's what uh, more or less an entrepreneur who's on the call or might uh, hear the recording uh, would be perhaps doing. I think I, I, I would be. I think what I find interesting in your journey is that, I mean, a lot of people um, uh, or entrepreneurs I've seen, they're very passionate about their, their ventures. And obviously it's their baby. They have created something out of nothing in a way, right? And they can't let go. And very often, businesses outgrow the entrepreneurs who have created them. Um, and I think just knowing when to let go is also as important as knowing when not to let go uh, <laughs> with the business. Yeah. And so perhaps I think it's important sort of uh, learning, uh, I think from your journey as well, I think there are, there are entrepreneurs who built that business, which were, they were there before you were there, obviously. And at some point they were, you know, the transition did happen and that actually benefited the business overall. So uh, maybe, a, you know, a lesson overall for, for a lot of other budding entrepreneurs, because 
I think we have a lot of, uh, we're at that stage in the Pakistani ecosystem development where you have a lot of first generation entrepreneurs uh, out there who started the business in 2018, 2019, 2020. And a lot of them have done their series, seed stages, series A's. And now they're sort of getting to a point where maybe they need more help or maybe they need to sort of sit back, you know, sit back a little bit and some other people need to take it to the next level. Uh, but but that that's I think something probably worthwhile highlighting in, in this journey. Um, no, I, I would cool. one, uh, Salman, I would say it's not necessary though. I mean, another yeah. way an entrepreneur can do that they need to understand where they have gaps and they can build a team which complements that. So it's not necessarily to to step down and then bring somebody else, which is a very viable strategy in case of extra hop at work. But you can also be more honest to yourself and then say, and that's what you said, that entrepreneurs sometimes have a tendency to just hold on and think that they, they can figure it out, but they can't. And that's where honesty is required. And, and the investors need to help you also, or the board basically, that, hey, you have gaps here. And if you are poor in marketing, you have a good technology and you're believing that, hey, we have built it, they will come. You need a very, very strong CMO and go and hire one, okay? Yeah. Or if your uh, sales organization is not penetrating, not helping you gain share, then go and change your, your CRO and then bring somebody in there, or, or, right? So so I think it can go both ways. Either you build a team which complements you, you can continue, or you, you make a transition and you continue to focus where you are good at, whereas uh, make sure that you bring somebody else who can do that. No, no, I think that, that you, you rightly put it. I think at the end of the day, it's about fitting your, your, your strengths with the needs of the business. And, uh, and if those strengths are sufficient, then that's great. And if there are gaps in certain areas, then you complement those gaps with people who can you know, fit, fit in those shoes, I guess, in, in that space. Um, so technical question for you. Um, so uh, first one I'm throwing at you in a way. Uh, so for cybersecurity product, uh, you need to collect a lot of data right to actually train your ai and uh, but to actually for for that data you need to have a lot of customers in the first place and in a way it's sort of a chicken and egg kind of issue right so how did you try to crack this um, on your side now if, if i understood the question appropriately yeah, yeah you definitely need to train your ml models uh, we, we have our own uh, security operation center in the company as well so that helps us do uh, train our models. But again, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of detectors which we build in based on knowing what are the typical uh, 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 anomalies and attacks are there, whether it's tied to ransomware or it's tied to uh, uh, all these, uh, 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 what was the recent one, uh, log uh, 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 4J or whatever, and, and, and the four. So you continually add more detectors in our business uh, and, and, and then train them either with our customers who are our what we call as a flagship customers or we do that within our own security operation center which is a small uh, uh, center uh, so I, I hope i answered that question no, no that, that 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 makes sense so you mentioned that you now sort of transition into more of an advisory role um, so are you looking to be to engage uh, or are you already engaged with uh, the Pakistani startup ecosystem uh, going forward? I mean, I, mean, I, I just am on the board of two uh, companies and, and, and maybe adding a third one. And then uh, I'm also entertaining becoming a operating advisor for uh, a, a PE company. Uh, there are a couple of them who are after me, uh, but I'm definitely uh, uh, Ali, I'm talking to you now recently, I've created more interest in me to look at what is going on. I'm very encouraged by the way, what is happening in Pakistan and I want to be a catalyst for that. And we'll definitely work with you and Ali who has done a tremendous job uh, to uh, fuel, uh, uh, put some more oxygen, give some more oxygen to the building scene there. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an, an area which uh, uh, is an opportunity for me to pay back uh, I haven't seriously looked at it, but that's an area I will be definitely uh, uh, looking at because I believe uh, it, it can become a good revenue and, and uh, foreign exchange income uh, earning potential for, for Pakistan uh, uh, going forward if it hasn't already. 
in terms of um, helping i guess pakistani startups um, scale up and I, i guess a lot of them are looking now businesses globally i mean if 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 there were pakistani technology firms looking to expand uh, in certain niche services service areas in the us what kind of advice would you give them uh, obviously they are coming from their home market uh, trying to offer services in the market which is i guess relatively mature uh, and then you know as different i guess uh, situation in terms of you know, skill sets and development but if you would give them any advice what would it be yeah i haven't been tracking much i mean as you can see i was so busy with in the last six years extra hard to, to to get to the point where we did what i do believe is that if you are in the services business where you are uh, part of the outsourcing uh, 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 line of business then you have to have a presence here in the us and and then have your commercial people uh, one or two here who are reaching out and using their contacts or whatever to be able to attach to long term projects in 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 companies uh so so i think that's very trickle i also would say that what is most encouraging is to uh focus on the product side in pakistan uh which i i think a lot of people are doing with their opportunities in fintech their opportunities in e-commerce but i think also opportunities in looking at the smb market the low end of the market and then coming up with not best of breed solutions but solutions which are good enough software kind of solutions which could either address the local needs so that we don't have to use our own foreign exchange, or you can sell it to other countries whether it be philippines or thailand or uae and all that and and i think instead of going for the best of breed my recommendation would be look for product areas which are good enough very software centric so you don't have to have huge capital uh, outlays to to develop it uh, that's uh, something i would highly recommend So last last two questions uh, on our side. So if you would sort of um, any leader you look up to um, on your side, a business leader you mean? Business leader, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, as as a uh, Pakistani, I mean, uh, nothing like Kaidi uh, Azam. Uh, uh, but from business point of view, I I think there are two people I really admire. I mean, they had an impact on my business. I mean, they had their own. No uh, human beings there. Nobody's perfect, so they have their processes. And on one was he was my second level manager at Danaher, and he now runs Electric Very Cool. I think he's uh, uh, one of the best CEOs that I've uh, seen. And then early in my stage was uh, my boss, who later on becomes of. Uh, uh novellus and lamb research in the bay area rick hill these are the two people uh i would say have influenced my uh, uh professional life quite a bit uh, i i find it interesting that you sort of uh, you you bring up people you immediately you know directly worked with a lot of time people when you ask this question from someone they would talk about somebody they've never interacted with much but they look up to <laughs> no i i <laughs> I uh, I might have misunderstood your question. Uh, uh, so so from my own, who had an impact on me, but on the other side of things, I mean there are a lo- lot of people who are very very impressive. I mean what uh, uh, Apple CEO uh, Steve Jobs in terms of innovation and creativity, that had his own aspect. What Bezos did on 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 execution and 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 how they continue to. I mean th- there are several of them you can look. I. I I don't believe that there is one which I look up to, but I just gave you the other answer that in my own business, yeah. my professional life, who were the two who really had an impact, and I would say that these two, Larry Kulp and Rick Hill. Last last question uh, for the for the evening. Um, one or two books uh, you could you would recommend people to read. Um, Actually, yeah, I, I still, yeah, you, you know, there are a lot of new books uh, these days, and I'm a little bit interested in fintech, and I think there's a new book on the future of money, and I forgot it's an, an Indian author. But for the business perspective, I really believe some old books are very relevant. So, 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 uh, uh, in in the, the the people who have read the uh, good to great book by by uh, uh, what is it, Phil Collins or some Collins uh, yeah. name. That, that is a great book where the whole concept of how do you develop a flywheel, okay, uh, in the business uh, is so critical for young entrepreneurs and all that. Right? Uh, and then similarly, the, uh, the the concepts around building businesses around core competencies. And I think this is again an old book, and, and that tells you my age. But these are fundamental things 
by, I think uh, CK Prahlad and some other guys uh, wrote that book that you build a company based on your core competencies. Uh, what your superpowers are these is the term people use and build on them. So, so I, I, I personally think that there are, uh, and in the whole old book on the, the, the blue ocean, uh, 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 where, where you're looking for white spaces where you, you want to grow into the, so while the new areas are more specialized and they give you a bit more sense of fine tuning, I think these older books, which I mentioned, whether it be good to great about the flywheel or building businesses, your know, core competencies, or, or the attractiveness of your market, I mentioned uh, Porter and all, these are like 20, 30 years old books, but they address, or, or uh, the Intel Andy Gross book on the paranoid the survivor, he talks about inflection points in businesses and the pivot came, concept came from there. I think these are good things to read for the entrepreneurs because those are the foundational business books which help you create businesses versus the, 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 the new ones which are very specific, very uh, niche topic, which are also very, very important because, hey, what do you want to do about digital marketing, right? I mean, and strategic pricing and all those kind of stuff. But I think foundationally for an entrepreneur, reading those books is very important, the ones which I mentioned. Thank, thank you. For, thank you for your time. I think um, um, you, you, you know, you, you sort of referred that, you know, it's sort of, allude, you know, certain books allude to your age, but in a sense, for me, uh, youth is all about being open to new ideas and experimenting uh, with, with, uh, with new structures. And I think your ability to actually pivot, uh, probably you're, you're far ahead for, you know, versus a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs at this point, uh, from that perspective. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate um, uh, you coming and sort of providing your views, uh, your, 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 your thoughts, your, your, your wisdom to a lot of the budding entrepreneurs on our network who are, who are obviously going through their own trials and tribulations, trying to build the next big thing uh, in Pakistan and, and globally. Um, again, uh, you know, we look forward to having you more engaged with the Pakistan uh, technology ecosystem with Park Launch. And, you know, inshallah, at some point uh, when you have time, you know, we'd love to have you uh, also advise some of the startups uh, on, on some of these areas. Yeah, no, I'll be happy. First of all, thank you for you and Ali for having me on this. It was a good conversation. And yes, <clears throat> I'm happy to help anytime free of anybody who has got questions about growing their business and areas if they are running into some, running into some walls and then how to circumvent them and be, always uh, happy to help thank you very much uh, thank you very much yeah good evening